Glad to see each one of you here today, and those of you who have joined us online, we are glad that you're with us. Uh, over the last three weeks, uh, well, the last two weeks, we've been in a series, uh, Renovate, and Pastor Nathan shared with us in week number one about Nehemiah's holy discontent, and then last week about the power of perseverance, and today we're going to continue the Renovate series, and the title today is There's No I in Team. There's No I in Team. Now, as most of you know, I have been the upper director here for actually the last 13 years, and uh, that's 26 seasons, spring and fall, 26 seasons, and uh, I've watched hundreds of teams come and go over those years. Hundreds of coaches have coached those teams. Thousands of players have played on those teams. And one of the awesome things, one of the best things of the whole year is to see a brand new little four and five year old team, you know, uh, they get out there on the field, the parents think they're gonna win like, you know, the World Cup or whatever. And, and, and you just have like this little herd of calves running around, jumping around the ball. And, and they don't know which end to go to when they start out. And they'll follow the ball from one field into someone else's field. And all of them are bouncing around. And, and, and it's amazing, it's an awesome thing. But by the end of the season, the coach has taught them actually which way to go, you know, uh, offense and some defense, uh, how to pass the ball. And the coach's job is to get all those little individual players on any team playing as a team. And there's never been a good team, an upward or any sports program in the world, there's never been a good team if you have a bunch of individuals playing as individuals. Championship teams must sacrifice and work together. They realize that there is no I in team. The team comes first over individual accomplishments and you can ask any coach that. Personal stats doesn't matter if your team actually loses. And all the great players that we've enjoyed watching over the years, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, Caitlin Clark, the new one, you know, uh, even Joe Burrow, if you know who he is, you know, these guys are amazing athletes, but each one of them knows that they can't win if everyone on the team is not doing their job. In the book of Nehemiah, he puts this amazing team together to accomplish this huge task of rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a city that God wanted his people to gather and literally be the light of the world as he blessed them, they were gonna bless the world. And in Matthew 5, 14, Jesus in the New Testament, he tells his followers, which are us, in Matthew 5, 14, it says, the light of the world, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. But the problem back in Nehemiah's day was the people of Jerusalem, they were not a light to the world, they were not living that way. Matter of fact, there was no city. The, the walls had been torn down for over 141 years. It's been a broken city. And Nehemiah hears about this and he gets so burdened. He gets this vision that he prays for four months and he keeps asking God over and over, you know, what would you have me to do in this bad situation? I need wisdom, God. And so he puts it on Nehemiah's heart to go to the king. And Nehemiah is willing to put his security and his comfort, and he risked by asking the king big, huge favors of the king. And they were 800 miles away from Jerusalem, but Nehemiah's asking this worldly king, he's asking him for permission to leave and go do. He was like the, the cupbearer, he was like right next to the king. He was an important guy. So he asked for permission from the king, he asked for resources, he asked for protection. Nehemiah's passion and vision helped him succeed on this mission. So I'm, I wanna ask you a question thinking about that. What are you burned about? What have you been burned about lately? What has you burned enough to be seeking God help in, in your life? You know, if you're gonna be a person that God uses to renovate something for him, you gotta be someone who cares, who prays, who's willing, who's prepared, and who perseveres, whether that's in your marriage, your family, your business, or all the God stuff that we do down here or in our city. The only reason that Nehemiah gets permission, and this is, this is huge, the permission, the resources, or the protection is because God's grace was upon him. 
Listen to Nehemiah 2.8. It says, because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. See, back in the day, God was in the miracle business and God's still in the miracle business today. And if we're gonna be used to do great things in this city, continually to be used to do great things in the city, we need to make sure that our job, that we're doing our job, we need to care enough, pray enough, be willing enough to make it happen. I've heard it like this, I love this. It says, we need to work hard like it all depends on us, and we need to pray hard like it all depends on God, amen? I mean, we need to be doing our part in helping building God's kingdom. God always is our answer. He's the one that always provides. Sometimes he just uses worldly kings and you know resources that we have no idea about to meet those needs. And anything good in our lives is because of God's grace on our lives. So after Nehemiah prays and he fasts and he travels 800 miles, he ends up in Jerusalem. You heard this last week, but in Nehemiah 2.11, it says, I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. So when he gets there, there's enemies all around and he just wanted to make sure what the real situation was. You know, he wanted to gather the intel that he needed to gather like the who's who and the what's what. He hadn't been to Jerusalem. He wanted to see the problem firsthand to get the proper perspective. See, Nehemiah knew for this massive task, he had to have a clear, well thought out vision to cast before the people. So after three days, he had all that information. And in Nehemiah 2.17, he says this. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. See, the people of Jerusalem, get this, this is sad. They got a custom walking around the ruins. They got a custom to walk around the brokenness. They, they walked around those stones and those walls for 141 years and no one did anything about it. And I was thinking, well, are we guilty of that? Like if we did a field trip to your house right now, everybody gets on a bus and we go to your house. Would I find broken things at your house that you could have fixed? That gate, that door, that squeaky whatever, that light. Your wives are punching you right now, right? Uh, I wanna tell you a little story, the Albertini's broken us, all right? We have plenty of it. Uh, for months, not like a month, not like a week, but for months, we had a first world problem. We have an automatic garage door opener and both of our remotes are broke, right? And so after a week, I'm like, I need to get a new battery. So I got a battery, put it in my remote and it still didn't work. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, we gotta find the right remotes and fix our garage door, blah, 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 blah. Months and months and months has passed. Leanne finds a little owner's manual to our remote. And she, she starts talking to me about it. I said, let me see your remote. I compare the batteries, the battery I put in compared to the original battery in her remote. And there's like a fraction of the same voltage, but just a, it was different. So we go to the store, get the right batteries, put them in. Now, now it's working. Now we got to reprogram it. I try for about 10 minutes, 100 degree weather, sweating to death. I gave up. I said, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'll just walk in the front door the rest of my life. I don't care. Leanne, the smarter, more patient one, stayed out in the garage for about 10 minutes and she reprogrammed it, came in doing her little happy dance and now we have remote, right? But I'd put up with that for months of brokenness for no reason. And you have to probably in your life, all right? But listen to what Nehemiah said back in 2.17. He says, you see, you see the trouble we are in. The gates are burned down, let us rebuild it. I mean, he had been there for three days and he saw the destruction. He said, hey, look at the trouble, open your eyes, stop what you're doing, fix it. Anyone can see the mess that we're in. And most of them had been there for years and years and years, but they just accepted the problem and did nothing about it. Not only did he point out the problem, he told them that God had already been working behind the scenes. And it's amazing, God is always working behind the scenes in our problems. We just don't know it sometimes. 
Listen to verse 2.18, Nehemiah 2.18. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me. See, Nehemiah made his relationship with the Lord personal. He said, and what the king had said. And if you're new to Cornerstone, the gracious hand, if, you're, if you've been here a long time like me, you've seen it, but for anybody that's new, God's gracious hand has been on this place. And we have been a city like on a hill that God wants us to be. Thousands have been saved and baptized, families restored, needs have been met. It's a place of comfort and belonging. Cornerstone has given people purpose for many, many years, and it needs to continue to keep shining in a dark city, right? For the next generation. Nehemiah is trying to encourage the people that he's not asking them to do something that God's hand isn't already working on. And we need to remember, as we start our project around here, we're in a renovation project and getting started on that. We need to remember at Cornerstone, God has already been working in and through this church over 20 years. And as a people of Nehemiah bought in, we need to stay focused in. And he says in Nehemiah 2.18, they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began a good work. They said, hey, let's go, man. The time is now. We've been waiting too long. It's time to get busy. And now that leads us in chapter three, okay? Now, chapter three of Nehemiah, man, it is a hard, I've told the other pastors, this is a hard chapter, right? There's all kind of hard names in there. I want you to read it by yourself tonight and, and you'll agree with me. But it shows us that all those who are doing God's work is important because it recorded in Nehemiah. Nehemiah or whoever wrote the book of Nehemiah would think it's Nehemiah. He made sure he recorded it and God made sure it was in the Bible. He knows who's doing the work. And nobody really knows how to pronounce all these names. I'm just gonna say that up front, okay? So I'm just gonna read it like I know what I'm talking about and hopefully sell you on it. All right, so let's go. Nehemiah 3, 1 through 4, we'll start there. Nehemiah 3, 1 through 4. Elishab, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. So the leaders started first, all right? They did. Uh, dedicated it and set the doors in place, building as far as the tower of the hundred, which they dedicated and as far as the tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section and Zachor, the son of Emre, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hashaniah. They laid the beams and put the doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshul, uh, Mesh, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, and next to him, Zadok, the son of Banna, also made repairs. So man, they're just going down this list, right, of, the, of what everybody's doing. And again, chapter three, there's 32 verses, a bunch of names in there. And the cool thing is, as you read in and try to figure out the name, but go past that and figure out what they're doing, there's all kinds of teamwork nuggets that we can pull out to apply to our lives today, all right? And one of the main things is that everybody is needed, needed for the task. You'll find the phrase next to him and the phrase they repaired, next to him and they repaired, next to him and they repaired over and over and over again. We need to remember if we're gonna do a great work and keep doing the great things for God as a team, everybody that's a part of the family, a cornerstone, needs to be on the mission. One talented player is great on any team, you know, but if we just rely upon that one talented person, we're going to miss out on some awesome things that God has in store for us. Over the last 35 years, Pastor Nathan has led this church doing great things, but 35 years ago, guess what? It was him and Trish who got the vision and they came down here to St. Cloud. And at the beginning, I've talked to him about this. Man, they had to do everything. They had to set up and tear down. They didn't even have this building. So they had to set up and tear down all day uh, Saturday, get ready for the service. They had to mow the grass. They had to preach. He had to preach, lead singing, teach classes. Pastor Nathan, Nathan was a youth pastor and the senior pastor. He had to do the hospital visits, the weddings, the funerals, the maintenance, on and on and on and on it went when they first started. 
And then as brilliant as he is, which he is, he realized, right? He realized, I said bad things about him last week. I'm saying good things about him this week. He realized that he can't do it all by himself. And as wise as he is, he sought out the four corners of the world. He looked for godly, spirit-filled, humble leaders to come alongside him. <laughs> to help him. And he hasn't found any yet, so, you know, here I am. If you know anybody, let them know. Because if a job or ministry stays about one person or one person's uh, gift set, the whole team is going to suffer in the end. Remember, there's no I in team. We're all needed. And all through Nehemiah, we see things about the team, the team, they, 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 them, work next to them. It was a group effort. And so I'm going to pick out three things that we can learn from Nehemiah that we can apply to our lives today. Number one, God uses all types of people for the team. See, he wants to use you and he wants to use me. In chapter three, there's rulers, priests, men, women, professional craftsmen, people from different towns came in to help. Uh, there's a place and a job for everybody once we get into the work of the Lord. The job is big enough for everybody. There's over 40 different sections that they had to put together and Nehemiah assigned different people for those jobs. There's no way that Nehemiah could have overseen and been at every one of those sections to make sure everybody was doing their job. So he delegated the leadership responsibilities to the people that he trusted. And they helped him make Nehemiah's vision and God's plan a reality. And remember a few weeks ago, I preached a message and it really ties right into this. We is greater than me. And I showed a picture of Daniel Jones, the quarterback of uh, the New York Giants. And I had that we is greater than me sign on his t-shirt. And I said this a few weeks ago. It says, none of us should be a casual spectator in our relationship with Jesus. We all should be active participants using our gifts as we follow him. And man, that is so true as we do works for the Lord. It takes all of us. And in 1 Corinthians, back then, we use a verse, one of the verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted. My favorite verse, I keep telling you that. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 11. It says, God alone decides the gifts that we have. We all have unique gifts. He's given you abilities. He's given you finances. He's given you passions to help come alongside and help carry out the vision and the purpose of building this great work for the Lord for this city. And God wants to use all of us in that. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this that there's some of you who are leaders at your job. You have the gift of leadership. Some of you retired as leaders. Uh, some of you have led ministries here in the past uh, or at other churches. And I was thinking, you know, if we're honest, and I like being honest, okay? And I'm not pointing fingers, so I'll look up here and I usually preach to myself. But some of you who have that gift, you might not be using those gifts down here for this family. You know, you're not, you're not using the gifts that God has given you to help continue to build these walls, to help the light shine brighter down here. You use them great out there, but as we come together as a family, a functional, healthy family, all the members work together and bring their gifts and their, and their treasure, all that, and we contribute and make it a greater, better place. And that's where we're headed, and that's part of this restoration process that we're going to be talking about over the next year. You might be new here and thinking, you know what? They don't need me. We just went through this series. Man, they can't use me. I don't have any gifts. Yes, you do. And we never have enough workers in any church. We always need more workers. And God wants to use each and every one of you in your skill set for his glory. I'll even say it one step further. All right. I like to do a lot of things, you know, like the task part of life. And if I'm doing something, I always want someone next to me, right? And since we're calling and talking about Nehemiah building a wall, 
Like hypothetically, like if I was carrying a load of bricks to help build that wall, I would want you to be right there next to me helping me because I, my back's bad, right? Yeah, help me carry these bricks. And that's how we should be looking out for each other. We should be looking out and looking for ways how God wants to use us for this great work. We're not just reading a story about thousands of years ago. God is continuing to build, you know, his kingdom and it's through us. We have the greatest calling in the world to make a difference for eternity. And God, we get to show God's love and shine the light of Jesus so others can see. And we always do it better together. Cornerstone and St. Cloud needs all of us doing our part. So as we renovate or we're renovating this campus here at Cornerstone, let's do our job and let's carry a load of bricks, so to speak, together and make the work easier for all of us. So the second thing, first thing is he uses all kinds of people. The second thing we see here is there are many positions on the team. So not only does he use all of us, there's many positions on that team, okay? And again, let me just go through chapter three and tell you some of the people that he used, all right? The different personalities and abilities. As you read it, goldsmith were used to build the wall, princes, nobles, priests, merchants, masters, servants, Levites, officials, regular people like me and you, you know, he used men, he even used kids, all right? Now the kids might've been voluntold. I love this verse, I don't know how old they were, but listen to Nehemiah chapter three, verse 12, Nehemiah three twelve. I love this dad. Shalom, son of Halo, uh, Halohish, okay, so uh, Shalom, the son of Halohish, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters, okay? And this dad is like me. If dad's on a project around the house or doing something, we're all on a project around the house doing something, right? He thought, hey, we're working hard and then we're gonna play hard. So he had his daughters working and helping him. And I, again, I think God put all this in there for us to remember that God knows by name those who are doing his work. And we, as we serve God, one of the things that we get to realize is God knows what we're doing for him. And that's just a comforting thought. We're not just doing it. We're pleasing the Lord along the way and he appreciates the work. Which leads me to the third point. It takes teamwork. And this is huge, okay? It takes teamwork. With any big task, you need a team, all right? And in a renovation task or renovating or rebuilding walls or re, uh, uh, renovating cornerstone, again, we need teamwork. Nehemiah was a very smart leader. He had people work on each section of the wall next to their house or next to where they lived, okay? In chapter three, there was 42 different teams that he put together. And these teams worked on their little community. It was like two and a half miles, you know, and he had, he had these teams spaced out, but he put them next to where they lived, all right? And, and as you read, it's, uh, they work by this gate or they fix that gate, they work by that gate. And those gates were, think about it like little subdivisions or communities. And I was thinking about the subdivisions around here. Like I live in Canoe Creek Lakes or Canoe Creek Woods or Canoe, uh, Canoe Creek Estates. Indian Lakes, Camelot, Sweetwater, Sawgrass, Stephen Plantation, all right? If you lived in those parts of the city, you'd be putting those, you know, you'd be building the wall next to where you lived. Listen to this in Nehemiah 3. I'm gonna read three verses here, 10, 23, and 30. Nehemiah 3, 10, it says, Jediah made repairs opposite his house and Hatush made repairs next to him. Beyond them, Benjamin and Hashab made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah made repairs beside his house. Meshulam made repairs opposite his living quarters. So again, the names of the workers next to where they lived. All right, now this fits perfect, unfortunately, but we just came through a hurricane, right? Oh, Hurricane Milton decided to visit St. Cloud this week, right? So the Albertinis, just like you guys, got your house ready for the hurricane. 
And Leanne and I were working, and I talked to some of you already after the hurricane, and you're in the same boat I am. As we put all 4,025 things in our yard into our shed, right? We realized we need to downsize. How many chairs do you need on your back porch, right? And it's like, as we shoved everything in the big yard into a little shed, you know, and we're like shutting the door to lock it, Leanne, she said, hey, you're boring up the windows, right? And guess where the boards are for the windows? The very, and I'm kidding you not, man. I'm not, this is the truth. In the very back of the shed after we loaded it up. And then she said, I think we should. And then she said, I'd feel safer if we board it up. And then she cocked her head and tapped her foot. You are gonna board up, right? <laughs> I had two choices. I could either board up and have a happy wife or I could face a storm of a mad wife, right? So we boarded up. Now listen, if you know the enemy or the hurricane is coming and maybe attack next to your house, you would work extra hard, just like we did, to make sure our property was protected from the storm. And that's excellent leadership. Nehemiah knew that the wives would be, you know, telling those husbands, hey, you missed a spot there, right? So anyway, they all were working on their section of, section of the wall. However, they were working as a team. All those sections had to come together and build the wall. And as a team, we need to make sure our house, God's house, Cornerstone, is secure and safe and renovated as nice as it can be for the next generation that's following us. We need to keep it strong for the next group. Teamwork involves a willingness to place the group and team above personal goals. And with any project, you have people that go above and beyond. Let me read you this in Nehemiah 3.20. This guy did it right, apparently. In Nehemiah 3.20, next to him, Baruch, the son of Zeb Zebiah, zealously repaired another section from the angle of the entrance of the house of Elisheb, the high priest. So this guy Baruch went above and beyond. He's zealous and it's recorded. You know, Nehemiah and God made sure that, hey, this guy worked hard. So for those of you who work hard, does anybody know that I'm working this hard? God knows that you're working this hard. But then there's another group. We don't wanna be in this group that they didn't work so hard, okay? Matter of fact, they didn't work at all. In Nehemiah 3, 5, it says, the next section was repaired by the men of uh, Tekoa. And the Tekoaites was in a town right next to Jerusalem, right? And their men were down there, they were working. But it says, but their nobles of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under the supervisors. Man, this group, they was like, man, we're not, we're not helping. And why didn't they help? And, and I don't know why they didn't help, but probably because they thought they were too good. I don't know. They were nobles. Maybe they didn't get their way. You know, Nehemiah was in charge and nobles like to be in charge, but maybe they said, nope, you know, if we're not in charge, we're not doing it. I, we don't know why, but, but we don't want to be that guy. It's like they didn't help. Maybe they thought they were too important. Maybe they thought that work was beneath them, you know, let the lowborns do with that. that let, you know, that they, they'll take care of that. No, it's recorded. You know, for whatever reason, it's recorded in the Bible forever that they didn't do the work. And I wanna be like that enthusiastic builder. I wanna zealously work for the Lord. And I don't always do that. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a hit and miss. But we wanna to strive to be that guy. And there's three kind of workers here in Nehemiah. There was some who did not work. Don't wanna be that guy some who worked and some who did enthusiastic work. And that's the reality of life and big projects. You have groups of people and we wanna make sure that we keep this place as strong as possible and as nice as possible as we go. So where are you, okay? As we're getting closer to the end here. Where are you in this story? Are you willing to do whatever it takes for the kingdom of God? And before you answer that, I want you to be careful because I'm getting ready to tell you the rest of the story, all right? 
In Nehemiah 3.14, there's a gate called the Dung Gate, D-U-N-G, all right? And the Dung Gate is exactly what it sounds like. It's the sewer gate, okay? Listen to this in Nehemiah 3.14. The Dung Gate was repaired by Melchizedek, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakurim, he rebuilt it and put the doors and their bolts and their bars in place. See, nobody probably wanted that job, but somebody had to do it. And it's recorded that the dung gate was repaired by uh, Melchizedek. See, he was a ruler, okay? And that's important. He was a ruler. He was an important guy. He was a significant guy. He was a busy guy. Definitely as a ruler, he was probably a smart guy and he probably had money. But yet he volunteered for the Dungate because as a leader and, 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 and a guy with wisdom, he realized that, that the importance of humility, and this is so crucial at any job that we ever have or anything that we do, humility needs to come into play because this leader, this ruler, this important guy, he humbled himself and that's Christianity. That's what Jesus did. Jesus lowered himself for us and we need to lower ourselves and we need to be willing to do whatever God needs us to do, even the dung gate, right? And Melchizedek's name will always re be remembered for the work that he done for the Lord. He did for the Lord. And serving God is usually not glamorous work at all, okay? It's usually hard. Sometimes it actually costs you money. Everybody loves the limelight, right? But the truth is that building walls is dirty work and there's no limelight, right? Definitely not building and rebuilding and refurbishing the dung gate. There's no limelight there, you know, but the job had to get finished. The task had to be uh, completed. And this guy was willing to do that. He went and worked and said, Nehemiah, I'll do whatever you need me to do. And we all have special gifts. I love talking about the gifts because that really sets us free just to know how God wants to use us. You know, and in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, it's all the gifts and the things how God wired each one of us up. But nobody probably back then had the gift of A, as a wall builder, while the enemy wanted to kill you gift, you know, they just saw a need Everybody got busy under Nehemiah's leadership and they built a wall. And it was an, it's an amazing feat that God did through those people to fill, build that wall. Might wanna write this verse down. This is a great verse. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And, and I love that. What we do for the Lord is not in vain. Sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes it's like, who cares? God cares. And, and the mission is important. And we need to keep living, being that light to our neighbors who's ungrateful or whatever, your coworkers, wherever God has you planted. And our labor for the Lord is not in vain. So let me encourage you with this, okay? As we renovate the church campus here, Cornerstone, we definitely need teamwork and, and we have it. Well, you guys, well, you guys are amazing. This is a great place to worship the Lord. Uh, so we need teamwork, we need giving, we need sacrifice, just like with any big project. We can't do it and we don't wanna do it without everybody on board. And remember, there's no I in team. Our buildings are for the people. Our buildings are about the next generation. Jesus didn't die for buildings. He died for people. But we get to use our buildings to reach the people that Jesus died for, right? And that's so amazing and we're so privileged. And, and as we just, every time I drive on this property, this, this is an amazing piece of property for the Lord. And we get to use it all week long to help further God's kingdom. And so the last few weeks, you've seen the renovation building fund needs as we close out today. And uh, these are big, right? These are our needs around here. $80,000 for the roof on building one. And that's a front building up there, A side. 
And uh, we told you this three weeks ago. This series started, guess what? Hurricane Milton made sure that uh, we needed the roof even faster. More shingles got thrown off of it, all right? $30,000 for the preschool, $125,000 for one air conditioning compressor, $125,000 for the second air conditioning compressor, so we can be comfortable in here. $45,000 for the carpet, and I always tell people we laugh about it, like, like we don't turn the lights on all the way because we don't want you looking down, all right? So anyway, need new carpet in here, $25,000 for the student auditorium carpet. So there's a lot of needs. And then the 12-month budget building fund goals, and these are listed out, and you have them on your sheet there, it, the praise God goal of $120,000. We're going to praise God. If we raise $120,000, man, we're going to praise God and uh, the kids won't be swimming over there in their auditorium when it rains and stuff. And we we're going to have some air conditioning. Hallelujah goal, $250,000. And the miracle goal, if one of you just want to write that check, for $445,000, we can get it all done and some more, right? So that's where we're headed. And we need everyone to participate in that. So here's our action steps, okay? We want you to take the uh, building fund commitment card. You, we handed these out last week. If you don't have one, we'll have some uh, ushers and greeters at the doors that you can grab one. And you can just please be praying what you want, uh, what God wants you and your family to do and how he wants you to get involved. And then you pray about this and at the end of the series, we'll be collecting these. And then there's something else cool. Uh, we do after a series, the pastors get together and we put a study guide together and you can go on our website and through Nehemiah, I did this last week, Pastor. This is, this is a study sheet from Nathan's message last week, uh, the power of perseverance. And you can do a deeper dive on your own or in your small group and make sure you take advantage of what's on our website, some really awesome things there. And you and your family can gather together and study more about into this and what God wants to do as we renovate our property and continue to be that light so the world can see what God's doing through his people. As he blesses us, we bless other people. So here's a closing prayer and it'll be up on the screen. It's on the bottom of your uh, commitment card there, but let's, let's say that together as we close today, okay? Together, one, two, three. Heavenly Father, our great and awesome God who keeps his covenant an unfailing love, hear our prayers and grant us success in our efforts for the next generation in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you for letting me share and thank you for letting me be a part of the team. God bless you. Have a Jesus-filled day. Amen.